the Argonauts. You have no idea how epic this story is. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. This might be the most epic team up story ever. Think Avengers meets One Piece meets X-Men meets Justice League. Just think every epic team up ever. Put it on steroids and you have the Argonauts. A team that includes a dude that can walk on water. A dude that sees in the dark and has some real X-ray vision thing going on. A huntress who is the fastest woman alive. And it's two personal Omega tier nuke heroes. Heracles aka Hercules, the strongest man alive, and the witch Medea, who is basically Scarlet Witch, bash it powerful and bash it crazy at the same time. And you have two male lovers, because when warriors are stuck on a boat for long enough, then hey, and everyone's gay once in a while. Oh yeah, and the whole adventure is them on a ship looking for treasure. Nani? Like what? That that sounds familiar. The only thing is that this is still Greek mythology, so you know, our heroes here kind of get a bunch of women pregnant and murder a lot of people, including one of them murdering their own children. <laughs> what the fuck? I went, I went too early with the Idris cough in this one, didn't I? I feel like I feel like I used it a little bit, a, a little bit too early this time. I didn't, I didn't. I. But anyway, it's because I'm excited about this one. I love. <laughs> I love the Argonauts. I love the Argonauts, man. The first superhero team up of all time. No biggie. Let's do this. The king was dead, and the throne of Iolcos was empty. The king left behind two sons, Aeson and Peleus. But Peleus was the king's stepson, so Aeson was the rightful heir to the throne. But, 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 Peleus wasn't just any stepson. No. He was only the king's stepson because the king's wife got one of those non-consensual nightly visits from pervy Aquaman. Yeah, she was impregnated by Poseidon. Peleus was the son of Poseidon, the god of the sea. So obviously, Peleus was quite powerful as a demigod and a bit of a bully. And Aeson, the rightful heir, was not only just a mere human. Aeson was also known to be a little bit soft. So Peleus went up to him like, I mean, is that true? Are you a little bitch? And Peleus just took the throne from Aeson and then exiled him to somewhere outside the city so Aeson and his wife eventually lived a quiet, unassuming life and also had a quiet, unassuming baby boy. But they knew that once King Peleus finds out that Aeson had a baby boy, another legitimate heir to rival the throne, they knew King Peleus would be like... So to save the baby, they gave it to Hion, a centaur, which means he was a horse from the waist down, half human, half horse. And this centaur Hion, he was basically the Mr. Miyagi of the time. Literally the greatest teacher ever in all things from philosophy to combat. I mean, Hion would later also turn Achilles into a walking, talking bad man that every man wants to be like and every woman wants to be with. I mean, come on, how are you even, how are you even, how are you supposed to compete with that? Come on, brat. But long before Achilles, Chiron was now raising and training the son of Aeson, and his name was Jason. He raised Jason from infancy until he was 20, and in a movie, this would be when we would cue the montage, you know, like the epic training scenes and him growing up, you know how it goes. My grandma runs faster than you, and she's only got one leg! And then, Chiron, one day, told Jason the truth. Like, Jason, you know that I raised you and you see me. I'm half a horse and you are fully human. So naturally, you must have questions. And now that you're old enough, I want to tell you that yes, it is horse-sized. And yes, you too will inherit it. Full size. <laughs> and you need to know that with great power comes great responsibility. I'm sorry teachers using this in class, I couldn't resist, I mean he's hoarse from the waist down. He told Jason that he was the rightful heir to the throne of Iolcos and that now he was ready to go and claim what was rightfully his. So you know he gave him the whole motivational speech, you know. Do you know what's there? Waiting! Beyond that beach! 
immortality. Take it. It's yours. And then he sent young Jason on his way back home. In the Orcos, meanwhile, the reigning bully king Peleus could never shake the fear of being usurped. He knew he had no legit claim to the throne, so like every single person in Greek mythology that is scared of something and is looking for someone to ease their mind, he went to the Oracle of Delphi. And the Oracle just made it worse, because the Oracle told King Peleus that one day a man wearing only one sandal would bring the king's doom. So now the king got mad, paranoid, and was on the lookout for anybody wearing only one sandal. And on top of that, just to make sure, he prayed to all the gods and made sacrifices to all the gods for their protection. But in his rush and in his paranoia, he forgot to pray to a god as usually not associated with the fates of men. He forgot to pray to Hera. And it's never a good idea to scorn Hera because... Hell have no fury. Like a what? And Hera is the queen of holding grudges. And now King Peleus was in Hera's death note. And she was actively looking for a hero to exact her vengeance on him. Enter Jason. Jason had just started his first adventure and put the skills Hiron taught him to good use. He killed some evil man-eating leopard that was terrorizing some folks somewhere. And then he started rocking leopard print way before our favorite trash TV stars did it. And with his DIY leopard coat, Jason had kind of made a name for himself and climbed the ladder of heroics high enough to get on Hera's radar. So then on his journey, Jason arrived at a river crossing and an old lady was sitting at the river bank, sad because she was too scared to cross the river, scared that the current would sweep her away. So being the good guy Jason is, he carried the old lady across the river on his back. And when they got to the other side, he noticed that the current of the river had swept one of his sandals away. But even more importantly, the old woman suddenly transformed into a beautiful, radiant, shining woman. And Jason was confused. Like, is, is that a gif now? Or is, or is that a myth? Like, how would you categorize that? The woman was Hera. Of course, Hera had disguised herself as an old lady to test the hero and his worth and decided he was worthy of her being his patron. Because patrons are important on any hero's journey, which is why I want to thank my patrons for supporting me on my journey on Patreon. And if you want to have all the artwork from these videos in high resolution to forever keep and download all of these videos and get about 30 more shorter exclusive videos, check out my Patreon from the link in the description. And this how you plug a Patreon. Now, you might be thinking, Hera actually helping someone, blessing someone? Yeah, it turns out that if you're not the offspring of Zeus's cheating, Hera is actually not all that bad. She approved of Jason and he was fit to be her hero in her beef with King Peleus. So one sandal down, one goddess's blessing up. Jason arrived in his hometown and as soon as he entered the town with just the one sandal, all these little snitches immediately reported to the evil king. Snitch. At the time, King Peleus was actually holding a banquet and games to honor his dad, the god Poseidon, which, I mean, that basically tells you everything you need to know about Peleus because that's the equivalent of you holding a banquet to honor R. Kelly, you know what I mean? Of course, once the king heard about a man in town with just one sandal, the king immediately sees that man, he sees Jason, but this boy, Jason, man, he had no chill, he had no, had no subtlety at all, he just straight up confronted Peleus on some boss thing and demanded the throne, like, what? Just like that. You think you can do this to me? King Kong ain't got shit on me! Of course, the king wasn't scared though, he was a demigod after all, but also, he wasn't fool enough to mess with someone trained by the legendary Hiron. Not if the king could avoid it. So he just he just asked Jason, Bro, if I walked in here and treated you like a punk, demanding the throne, what would you do? And Jason was like, I will send you on an adventure that you were sure to die on and lie. That if you make a berg alive, you'd have proven your worth and can have the throne, you know? And the king was like, uh, 
Congratulations, you played yourself. And so King Pelias sent Jason away on an adventure that he was sure to die on and lied that if he makes it back, he'd have proven his worth and can have the throne. That adventure was to get the Golden Fleece. And I feel like everybody just throws that around. Get the Golden Fleece, the Argonauts sent the Golden Fleece, Golden Fleece this, Golden Fleece that. Bro, am I the only one who has no idea what the Golden Fleece really does? Like, why does everybody just gloss over that? That's like telling a story about the One Piece without anybody knowing what the One Piece is. Well, I'm not everybody, so I'm not glossing over anything. I'm gonna tell you exactly what the Golden Fleece is all about, which I guess is another video within this video. First of all, it is a fleece, unsurprisingly, which is wool. By the way, fleece is wool, if you didn't know. And specifically, it's wool from a ram, a golden ram also, unsurprisingly. And that ram, that ram will, my, will actually be important later, and I just realized I structured this wrong, but I was too lazy to rewrite, so we're keeping this. There once was a man named Phrixus, and he had a twin sister, Ellie, and the two were the children of Athamas, a king, and his wife, a goddess of the clouds, named Nephile. Naturally, with the king being mortal, he didn't live with his goddess wife, but with a human woman, Ino. And stepmother Ino hated the king's children Phrixus and Ellie, so the evil stepmother devised an evil plan to get rid of the children. Did anybody ever notice that in, in fairy tales, stepmoms are always evil, and now in the 21st century, stepmoms are always horny? I mean, just, just food for thought, like, what happened there? I prefer the 21st century stepmom. So the evil stepmom devised an evil plan to get rid of the twins. First, she ruined all the crops in the kingdom. Then she bribed the farmers to go to the oracle and ask what to do to get new crops and then lie to the king that the oracle said the twins, his children, needed to be sacrificed for the kingdom to ever have crops ever again. So they did that, they went to the king and lied, but of course the king, the loving father, he said, well sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, and he agreed to sacrifice his children, but just before they were killed, a flying ram with golden wool appeared to save them, the ram was sent by their godly mother Nephele, and the ram carried them away to safety, flying high in the sky above the oceans, and then Ellie, the woman, she fell off the ram and drowned to her death anyway. <laughs> it's okay though, because at least we now call the waters where she drowned the Ellis Pond in her honor. Consolation. Phrixos, the brother, he survived though. He survived and the ram took him all the way to Colchis, where King Aetis ruled. And the kind king gave Phrixos a new home. So of course, Phrixos was forever indebted to his rescuers, the king who took him in, and the ram who kept him from being killed as a sacrifice. So as thanks, Phrixos killed the ram as a sacrifice to the king. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. I love Greek mythology. He's literally snoring. Can you hear that? And then Phrixos gave the king the ram's golden fleece, which Aetis proudly hung from a tree in the holy grove of Ares, a symbol of friendship and kindness. The golden fleece was so precious that it was now forever guarded there by a dragon that never slept. And then the king gave his new friend Phrixos a new life, a life at the king's court where Phrixos could... Yeah, an oracle told the king that Phrixos would one day kill him, so the king killed Phrixos first. So, with his main quest now acquired, our main character, Jason, had to gather companions. And you best believe that Jason's milkshake brought all of Greece's heroes to the yard. Jason literally assembled the justice straw hats of the time. See what I did there? I just assembled from Avengers Justice, from Justice League straw hat. No, no. You think I'm over explaining my jokes? At least I'm not actually, actually falling asleep during work hours, just looking pretty. I'm just, I'm just saying. Man. The who's who of Greek mythology. Think of it like. Whatever series you're into, one of them probably has some ominous characters that are S-tier strong and the stuff of legends to appear later in the series. Imagine all of them assembling on one crew and you have the Argonauts. 
First of all, there was Heracles, aka okay, Hercules, which no introduction necessary because. Man, you better check my police record. You don't know who you messing with. I slap people for fun. That's what I do, man. Then there was Theseus, the famous hero that killed the Minotaur and was later portrayed by Jennifer Lawrence in his movie adaptation. Yeah, seriously, the Hunger Games are just Theseus' story, but. I digress. Then there was Atalanta, the mandatory badass woman, the greatest huntress and the fastest human alive. Orpheus, the mandatory soft musician who can't fight, but his music can serenade anybody. The famous Gemini twins. I mean, that in itself is already so badass. Imagine an epic series where there's just some, you know, some famous ominous Gemini twins that are only revealed in like the last season. Psst, epic. These Gemini twins had names though, Castor and Pollux, who everybody calls Pollux, but his actual name is like Polydeuces? How cool of a name is that? Multiple deuces? I mean, come on, Polydeuces? I know it's not pronounced Polydeuces, but you know, Castor and Pollux. Then there were two dudes with wings, Calais and Zitis, because as if this crew wasn't cool enough already, I mean, of course they had dudes with wings, and also Echion, son of Hermes, who had such a silver tongue that he could smooth talk anyone into anything, and Ephemos, a dude that can walk on water, and another guy that has x-ray vision and can see in the night. Lingifs. <laughs> Come on. This is a superpower team up with a capital team up. Come here. I love Greek mythology. Did I mention that? Unfortunate side note though Theseus, Atalanta, and the Water Walker, they're not really going to feature in this video. Yeah, sorry for the blue balls, but there's literally like over 50 people on this group and so many versions of this tale, and a lot of those names are just in there because they were big and some writers would just put them there to say, oh, they're part of this journey, you know, like bad crossovers. But then they don't really do anything. So I'm only going to focus on the ones that are actively involved in the main adventures that I'm focusing on. But for the record, for example, also Achilles' father was part of the group. And I'll list the full list of heroes in the video description. I'll only focus on the active members. Let's start their journey. Remember the guy that was saved by the golden ram and then sacrificed it on some punk snitch trader thing and from the dead savior ram the golden fleece was born, remember that? Yeah, punk snitch trader guy also had a son and that son's name was Argo and Argo just so happened to be an amazing shipbuilder and Jason commissioned Argo to build him a ship for his newly assembled crew and because Hera was the patron of the crew she then blessed Argo to build a divine ship that would never rot and has the ability to navigate the open sea which at the time no ship had done before back then sailors were still hugging the shore line like virgins are hugging the walls on a club but Argo built this masterpiece of a ship and to honor the goddess he put a massive Hera figurehead in the front of the ship through which the crew could actually talk to the goddess a figurehead allowing the ship to actually talk to the crew I mean, if you're a One Piece fan this will make it go the ship was perfect and in honor of its builder it was named Argo. And now all that was missing was a captain. Of course, since Jason put this whole thing together and gathered all the heroes, everyone agreed that the captain should be Heracles. The Heracles was in the middle of his 12 labors. He was the most famous and strongest and bravest man in all of Greece. Easy choice. But Heracles said that he already has his own adventures for glory and doesn't want to take any shine from Jason. He said that this was Jason's time to shine and that Big J should be the captain of the group and so it was decided that the gang called themselves the Argonauts, the sailors of Argo. That's the actual translation. And with that our heroes were off on their adventure to retrieve some golden wool from the kingdom of Colchis to retrieve the golden fleece. Adventure number one, the island of 
women. Six days after setting sail, Jason and the gang arrived on the island of Lemnos. Now I'm not sure how many of you remember my Aphrodite video, but here's a little recap of what Aphrodite did to the women of Lemnos because they didn't worship her. Actually, the title card is the whole recap, that's it. Like, they didn't worship her, so the goddess of love made all the women stink. Like, <laughs> we're talking vomit-inducing type of stank. <laughs> you get me? So all the women's dudes basically stayed away from their ladies all week, spending their time on the nearby mainland where they hooked up with other women that, you know, didn't smell so bad it makes you have to vomit. Understandable, I guess. So eventually, when the men came back home, back to Lemnos, the women of Lemnos killed all of the men. Not just their husbands, not all of the men of Lemnos were butchered. Every single one. And because these stinky ladies had no chill, they even danced with the chopped up corpses of the men. And that's how the stanky leg was invented. Except one stinky lady actually showed mercy, Queen Stank, Ipsipili. She was the only one who actually spared a man by putting him in a casket and then casting it out into the ocean. <laughs> Not sure if that's better than just killing the man. Oh yeah, and that man was her father. So you get the gist of what Team No Deodorant was all about, meaning that when the Argonauts anchored on the island, they had to come up with a plan to not be treated as hostiles. And so they sent Echion, the smooth talking son of Hermes, to talk to the stinky girls. And when Echion approached them, this is literally what happened. Hey, little troublemaker. <laughs> The women fell for the Argonauts hard, because after years of being without men, their loins were longing. You get me? Also, for some convenient reason, the story doesn't mention them smelling bad anymore, so either the sailors were just that horny after just six days out at sea, or it's a major plot hole. Whatever the case, the Argonauts hooked up with the women of Lemnos and... That's it. Journey done. <laughs> Six days into the adventure, they literally just hooked up with all these women, got drunk with them all damn day long, and forgot about their journey. I mean, who cares about some golden wool when you can have an island full of beautiful women? Well, it turns out... Heracles stayed behind at the ship and didn't care to even meet the women, which... A, I mean, this is the same guy that once slept with 50 women and 50 knights and impregnated all of them. But also, fair enough, because Heracles was in the middle of his 12 labors, which he did for killing his wife and children. Probably wasn't feeling like getting anybody new pregnant right about now. So Heracles went up to Jason and slapped around like a pimp. And he finally made all the Argonauts leave the island after the crew had turned the island of Lemnos from the island of women into the island of abandoned baby mamas. Because that's what heroes do. The island of the Mount of Bears. For their next stop to restock supplies, rest and feel some solid ground under their feet, the crew anchored on the island of the Mount of Bears. Which is completely misleading because none of this has anything to do with bears. Instead, the island was inhabited by the Doliones and their newly crowned king Kisikos, who was about to also be the newly wed newly crowned king Kisikos, so the Argonauts kind of crashed that wedding, but they were more than welcome to. Kisikos was a good dude, which meant that our heroes basically went from an island where they had non-stop sex to an island with a massive party where they got drunk and had non-stop sex. Man, if I had known that this is what it means to go on a legendary adventure, I would have been like, I volunteer as tribute. Once again, Mr. Oh, I'm so serious now because I accidentally killed my wife and three sons, Kles, stayed behind at the ship. And while the Argonauts were partying with the king, the king was like, ah, by the way, I forgot. Uh, there's like a bunch of six-armed giants on the island that attack and kill anything that's not safe behind these city walls. Basically anything that's not at the party right now. Just FYI. But whatever. I'm married. I'm so happy. Let's get drunk. So, of course, the giants came for Heracles and the ship, but... Not to worry, this is the mighty Heracles we're talking about here. So when the giants approached, my guy Heracles was just like... Hey, 
And Heracles single-handedly genocided the race of evil six-armed giants on the island. Then, after the party was over, Heracles and his drunk horny sidekicks left the island to continue their journey. But in the night, out in the open sea, they got caught up in a storm and had to quickly make an emergency anchor at the nearest island that they only ever saw because the lightning of the storm was so powerful that it lit up that island. But once they anchored on that mysterious island, the entire crew was suddenly attacked by wild barbarians that fought them to the death. But of course, you don't attack Heracles and his drunk horny sidekicks and live to tell the tale. The Argonauts slaughtered every attacker and just as Jason put his spear through the chest of the last one, lightning cracked in the sky above and Jason could see the dead man's face. It was the newly wet and newly crowned King Kisikos. Now the newly dead King Kisikos, and all around him were his dead friends, the men the Argonauts had just partied with. Hung over from the party, the soldiers mistook the Argonauts for invading attackers in the dark of the night and neither side recognized the other until the Argonauts were the only side left standing. Jason and the crew stayed on the island for three days and three nights to mourn the dead and then left the Mount of Bears after turning a happy wedding into the world's first red wedding. Because that's what heroes do. The Nerf for their next resupply stop, the Argonauts docked at the island of Mysia. They didn't just need food and water, they also needed a new oar, because Heracles was rowing so hard that it was literally him on one side of the boat and everybody else on the other side, and his oar couldn't handle his strong grip, so it snapped. That meant that Heracles was out on the island looking for some wood, and Elas, the man Heracles regularly gave his wood to, joined him. Yeah, surprise, strong Heracles had a male lover on board with him. Mm -hmm. And while Heracles was looking for the right tree to cut down, his lover, Elas, went to fetch some water. But it turns out that maybe the oar wasn't the only thing Heracles' grip was too strong for, because while looking for water, Elas, man, he cheated on Heracles. From the river where Elas refilled the ship's water supplies, a beautiful nymph emerged to kiss him and then several other nymphs emerged. And I don't know how much you know about water nymphs, but they're usually butt naked. And they asked Elas to come with him. And my man Elas turned into Aquaman with a quickness like <laughs> you know, going with the nymphs into the depths of the ocean, never to be seen again. Can't blame him. Worried, Heracles looked for his lover until the god Hermes appeared to him to tell him the truth. Bro, we the gods, we orchestrated all of this. We orchestrated Elas' disappearance because brother, you gotta get back to your 12 labors dog. What are you doing with the Argonauts? Also, they realized that Heracles is a massive cheat code and this whole golden fleece thing is supposed to be a test for new heroes, not a new game plus for Heracles. So they had to nerf the Argonaut crew hard. So hard broken, Heracles left the crew. While all this went down on the island, the crew was just idling and drinking and they forgot all about Heracles and Elas because they were busy with <laughs> mutiny. More and more, the crew, the, the, the heroes, they were saying that Heracles was the real captain and that Jason was a punk. So they argued like, I'm no punk bitch. I ain't no punk bitch. Neither. I'm no I'll punk bitch. And then to prove them wrong, drunk Jason was like, I'm going to show you. And poutingly waited for the perfect wind to set sail again, eager to prove his worth to these fools who question his leadership. And when the perfect breeze suddenly came, Jason did set sail and forgot all about Heracles. That obviously made it seem like he left Heracles behind on purpose out of jealousy, so the argument escalated again and mutiny was at hand until the gods intervened to reveal that they had separated Heracles from the group on purpose and also sent that perfect breeze so that the Argonauts can get the hell on with their journey without the mighty hero. The Boxing King 
Without Heracles, the Argonauts' next stop for resupply was the land of the Vivrikes, who were famous for their king, who was convinced that he was the best boxer in the world. And to prove it, every visitor had to send one man to meet the boxing king in the ring. And so far, every man that faced the boxing king died. And you can see where this is going, right? And why Heracles had to conveniently be taken out of the equation just before comes to test of strength. Of course, the Argonauts were immediately challenged by the king. Tomorrow night, I'm gonna smash your boy, guys. I'm gonna smash your boy. The perfect opportunity for Jason to step up and prove his leadership and bravery. So he didn't say anything and let Polydeuces step up to fight the king. And the fight between Polydeuces and the boxing king can best be summarized with the following clip. Analyze this fight pattern. Scanning. Countermeasures ready. Let's kick his ass. Yeah, the king was overwhelmingly strong and big, but once the smart Polydeuces, Pollux, had analyzed his moves, he countered the boxing king with a perfect and vicious punch to the ear that shattered the king's skull. The king was dead on the spot. And his people, the Vivrikes, were outraged, so they attacked the Argonauts in an all out brawl. But of course, the Argonauts whooped them, whooped them so bad that the Vivrikes ran away crying. And then the Argonauts stole all their cattle and supplies and left the island. Thanks to the Argonauts killing their king, the Vivrikes were now defenseless and were attacked by the surrounding enemy kingdoms, and all the Vivrikes died. Basically, the Argonauts turned the Vivrikes from a kingdom into an extinct people. Because that's what heroes do. The Argonauts versus the Harpies. Next, our heroes arrived at a small island where they met Phineus. Phineus was a man with the ability to prophesy things. And back in the day, Phineus went around Greece and used his ability of foresight to warn people of their death or impeding tragedy. So Zeus punished him for meddling with fate. Zeus turned the young man, Phineus, into a blind old man, so old that his brittle bones are now merely held together by his saggy skin. But that was enough. Zeus was so angry that Phineus meddled with fate of men that he also cursed him to eternal starvation. Every time Phineus attempts to eat, harpies appear out of nowhere to eat all his food before he can even get a bite in, and then, for no reason, they also poop on his plate and his cups so one old blind man one cup it was because sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do if you know the reference you know and if you don't be glad but despite being old blind weak and on their poop diet Phineus could still see the future so he knew the Argonauts were coming and knew that they would save him from his fate so he welcomed them with tears of joy because he knew that the two winged Argonauts Calais and Zetis would save him from his curse once they heard about his suffering and just as he foresaw they did that Calais and Zetis killed all the harpies flew after them slaughtered them and when the Argonauts left this island Phineus was still old still blind but he was no longer starving because the harpies were dead so he was finally free from the curse because that's what heroes wait that's that's actually that's actually what heroes do good job argonauts i'm still kind of waiting for jason to actually do something but yeah other than that good job good job guys well done the clashing rocks and the iron birds on their way to their next stop, the Argo and its crew had to navigate the infamous moving Civiligades, the clashing rocks, a narrow part of the sea with massing moving cliffs on either side that would clash into each other the moment anything passes through, smashing whatever is between them so that no ship may ever pass. And I just want to say, this whole thing already had major One Piece vibes throughout, but I swear, moving cliffs? 
this is literally something that could be straight out of One Piece. That I could see One Piece using that, and now you know where it will come from. But after helping Phineas, the old man used his gift of prophecy to foresee a way that the Argonauts can pass the clashing rocks safely. And Honestly, this is the most disappointing part of the story. The epic way to pass these rocks that they needed a prophecy and foresight to think of was just to let a dove fly through first. And when the cliff smashed the dove and had to pull back to smash again, the Argonauts just quickly rode through the narrow past the cliffs. Super lame. Once they made it past the dangerous cliffs, our heroes then sailed past the island of the Amazons with a quickness because they did not dare to enter that island. Heracles had told them about his war with the Amazons for one of his labors. The Argonauts did not want any of that Wonder Woman smoke. But that meant that they didn't have anywhere to anchor and had to sail the dark seas longer than usual and so they got caught up in a night so black you couldn't see the hand in front of your eyes. Luckily, they had Lingifs on board, the man who could see in the dark and could safely navigate them even through the darkest of nights. And I just want to point out that that ability would have been pretty, pretty damn useful when they fought the newly wet, newly crowned and now newly dead king and killed him and his people because they didn't recognize them. But hey, what do I know about superpowers and supervision? Eventually, Lingiefs navigated them to an abandoned island with an ancient and equally abandoned temple dedicated to the god of war, Ares, which was so abandoned that a flock of birds had made it their home. And we're not just talking any birds. <laughs> we're talking birds that were straight out of Dark Souls. Massive birds with iron beaks and iron wings that they could shoot at their enemies. And if that sounds familiar to you, yeah, they are the same birds that Heracles had to fight on one of his labors, the Stymphalides Ornithifs, who took up residence here after Heracles had defeated them elsewhere. In fact, back then, even Heracles was no match for the birds in combat and only defeated them by exploiting their only weakness, extreme noise. Heracles drove them away with the loud noise of magical drums, and since I'd assume that the Argonauts and Heracles talked a lot about his first couple labors, Jason and his crew knew exactly what to do. Well, to be precise, they banged their spears on their shields and marched on through the birds, scaring them away. And that's the power of music! In the abandoned temple, the guys then found more than just shelter. They found a pair of shipwrecked brothers who got stranded on the island and hid from the birds inside the temple. And it turns out that the two brothers were the grandsons of King Aetis, and King Aetis just so happened to be the very king in possession of the golden fleas that they went on this whole entire adventure for. How about that? Of course, the Argonauts rescued the brothers and with them on board with the grandsons of the king on the Argo, they now knew the fastest and most direct route to reach their destination. Finally, the Argonauts arrived in Colchis, and being the rescuers of the king's nephews, they got a warm welcome. King Aetes immediately invited the crew in for dinner and introduced them to his daughters. One was the mother of the two brothers that they had just rescued, and the other was a certified walking nuke, an OP powerhouse of epic proportions. She was the sorceress, Medea. More on her OP powers later. Over dinner, the rescued grandson brothers were obviously gushing to the king about the Argonauts and how they saved them from certain death and that they should be rewarded with the Golden Fleece for their efforts. A logical proposal. Logical. If you ask me. But for some reason, all the king heard was, Grandpa, they're here to kill you and take your throne. So for absolutely no reason other than not to give away some golden wool that was given to him by a man he had killed anyway, to not give away that wool to the men that literally just saved his grandsons, the king instead decided 
hey, I'm gonna kill the Argonauts. So he told the Argonauts that if they want the Golden Fleece, they have to pass a challenge that is certain to kill them because it is equal to the labors of Heracles. The task was to tame a pair of wild and very angry fire-breathing oxen and use them to plow a magical field and then sow that field with the teeth of a dragon, teeth which would then insta-grow into a skeleton army that the challenger then had to defeat in order to be rewarded the golden fleece. Without a guy like Heracles, that was kind of an impossible task, but luckily the Argonauts still had their patron goddess Hera on their side. Hera immediately threw her weight around Mount Olympus a little bit and told Aphrodite to tell her son Eros to help the Argonauts by making the powerful walking nuke Medea fall in love with Jason. And one little love arrow from Eros later, it was so. Medea took one look at Jason and was madly in love. Knowing that the labor would be impossible for any of the Argonauts' members, Medea stayed up all night worrying on how to rescue the new love of her life and the sorceress finally came up with an idea, a powerful potion. A potion that was made from a flower that grew from the blood of the forever tortured Prometheus and that potion would grant whoever drinks it complete invulnerability to everything. Fire slashes everything. And yeah, it's a literal cheat code potion. And then, like anyone who ever tried to get his love returned, Medea blackmailed Jason into loving her back or else he won't get the potion and he will die. Of course he said yes. And also, Hera had told Jason about Aphrodite's intervention and then he could never pass this test without the help of Medea. Jason accepted, swore his eternal love to the sorceress and drank the potion. And now, Finally, it was time for Jason to step up and be the leader he was meant to be. Now, Jason truly was. Yeah, by the way, that's where I got that soundbite for my title cards from. <laughs> great show, great show, by the way. Do watch it. I want to say Jason is mad courageous for this, but, uh, you know, after drinking a potion that makes me literally invincible, I think even I could tame two fire-breathing oxen and tie them to a plow and defeat an army of skeletons that grow from the dragon teeth I threw into the magical field. Anyway, Jason, of course, did all of that, and ultimately he stood victorious amongst the bones of his undead enemies. And if the tale of the Argonauts were to have a happy ending, this would have been the moment for it. But of course, this is Greek mythology and there is no such thing as happy endings. Because I'm pretty sure happy endings really originated in Asian massages. I don't think Europe offered happy ending massages back in those days. Also, here's some friendly advice, just in case you ever find yourself in this situation. If you want something from someone and they say, okay, you can have it, but only if you complete the task, which will kill you with 99% certainty. If you do survive, they're probably still going to want you dead. So the king still wanted the Argonauts dead. And of course, he had no idea Medea, his daughter, was madly in love with Jason and would betray her father in a heartbeat. So the king shared these plans with his daughter and she went straight to Jason with more blackmail for true love. Like, I know something that you need to know, otherwise you'll die again. And because I love you. <laughs> I don't want any harm to happen to you. I love you. So I will tell you if you again promise to keep me safe forever and marry me and don't forget otherwise you'll die. So this time Jason swore on his patron goddess Hera to keep Medea safe forever and marry her. And so Medea told him that her father plans to not honor his promise and plans to have Jason and his entire crew killed. She told him that if he wants the golden fleece then they need to go now in the cover of the dark to the grove of Hades where the golden fleece is protected by a mighty dragon that never sleeps, never so much as closes his eyes so it's impossible to get past the dragon. Yeah, Medea cast a spell on the dragon that immediately made him fall asleep and then Jason just took the golden fleece. I'm telling you, Medea is <laughs> it's OP as hell. You definitely want Medea on your crew. Cause girls is players too. After successfully stealing the Golden Fleece, the Argonauts and Medea used the cover of the night and got the hell out of Colchis. But of course, the king soon found out that the Fleece and his daughter were gone, so he sent his son to chase after them and kill the Argonauts. 
a massive sea chase ensued and of course Medea was completely torn up over what to do. On the one hand she loved Jason but on the other hand her own family was chasing them and she also loved her brother and wanted to keep him safe. Yeah Medea fake surrendered to her brother then captured him and chopped him up into pieces and then threw the pieces overboard so that her dad has to stop his ships to pick up the pieces of his dead chopped up son which slowed him down enough for the Argonauts to escape. Medea had no chill at all. So finally the crew had the golden fleece and now all that was left was to return home. And I don't know if you remember but Orpheus was also on board of the ship, the musician, and so far he'd kind of been like But finally Orpheus time to shine came because after the Argonauts escaped their pursuers they got lost in the treacherous waters of the sirens, dangerously beautiful women that serenade men with their music luring them into the depths of the oceans just to drown them. But not with Orpheus on board. Orpheus' music was so much more beautiful than the sirens singing that their powers were useless and only one thirsty Argonaut jumped into the water to his death because he couldn't resist chasing that siren nut. Understandable. Fun fact, nowadays everyone thinks sirens are like mermaids but mermaids are half fish and half woman. Sirens actually half bird and half woman and that was back in ancient Greece just over time they became mermaids. Huh? All seemed well now for the crew of the Argo and it should have been smooth sailing home from here on out but then Zeus got involved. Zeus was pissed because killing family members is one of the greatest sins in Greek mythology. Note that Zeus sleeping with his family members is absolutely fine. <laughs> and Medea had just chopped up her brother into pieces. So Zeus was angry, conjured up a massive wind that blew the Argonauts off course and into more dangerous waters where only the help of Hera helped them navigate those waters infested with dangerous rocks and currents that would usually be the doom of any ship. And at this point of the story, it's basically Zeus and Hera waging a proxy, a war of their terrible marriage and the Argonauts suffer for it. You know, those two really need marriage counseling. So Zeus blew them of course, Hera intervenes, rinse and repeat two or three times until Zeus finally manages to blow the Argo away of course onto the shores, the sands of Libya where they stranded in a massive desert. So what did the Argonauts do? They casually carried the Argo across the desert for 12 days and 12 nights and set sail again on the other side of Libya. Because that's what heroes do. Oh, and one more side note for our mythology nerds here. As they crossed the desert, the Argonauts came across the garden of the Hesperides, where Heracles had just recently stolen the golden apple for one of his twelve labors and killed another tree-hugging guardian dragon. And the Argonauts actually saw its corpse. Also, as they crossed the desert, one of the Argonauts was bitten by a poisonous snake and died, and those poisonous snakes only existed in that desert because once upon a time Perseus flew high above the sands with the blood from the severed Medusa head dripping into the sands below giving birth to the region's venomous snakes. How cool is that? It's all connected y'all man. I want to create a Greek mythology MCU like universe so badly you know what I mean? It will work so well. Netflix, HBO, whatever man hit me up. I'll write the story I can write and I want to play a role. I don't know which hero I can play, but I want to play. I can bulk up, I want to play one of the heroes. Anyway, so the Argonauts made it out of the desert and back onto open waters. And now there was only one obstacle left between them and home. The giant Talos. Talos was a bronze giant created by Hephaestus and he lived on the island of Crete where he protected one of Zeus's mistresses from pirates and other wannabe kidnappers. That mistress was Europa. Of course the Titan could not distinguish the Argonauts from a pirate ship so he bombarded the Argo with boulders and the Argonauts had to anchor their ship to battle the giant and once again it was time for the Argonaut leader Jason to step up by letting Medea take care of business. <laughs> Talos had one vein running from his neck to his ankles that pumped the magical blood that kept him alive and that vein was secured by one bronze nail. 
The Scarlet Witch Medea used her magic to remove the bronze nail and the giant collapsed and bled to death. Once again, Medea saved the day. Cause when you were boss, you could do what you want. Yeah. Uh. After Crete, the Argo arrived back in their home waters. The adventure was done, so the Argonauts disbanded, and with the Golden Fleece in his possession and his wife Medea at his side, Jason finally returned home. Oh, and also along the way, Medea and Jason had two children. Yeah, timelines is very tough in Greek mythology. It's not its biggest strength, but just know these sea voyages take ages. So there was realistically time to have two children and it was just hard to fit it in a narrative earlier. So Jason, his wife Medea and their two children were now back home in Iorcos to deliver the golden fleece to the false king Peleus and reclaim the throne in Jason's name. But remember the life lesson I taught you earlier. Never make a deal with someone that sets you up to die for your side of the deal. Yeah, the king obviously didn't honor the deal, he never had any attention to. So what? Jason brought back some golden bulls? <laughs> Cute. Nah, man. The king was still the son of a god. He was a demigod, son of Poseidon. So he lied. Big whoop. Bold and powerful. The king squared up to Jason like... You know, you know, see what happens when you deal with a liar? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what happens yeah, when you deal with yeah, a liar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I lied to your little punk ass. Right. Now I'm gonna kill you. But it was it was one big problem that the king wasn't ready for. Before the king could do anything to Jason, Medea intervened. She told the king of her powerful sorcery and said that, yeah, 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 yeah you can keep the throne. In fact. I'm gonna use my sorcery to make you even younger so that you can keep it for even longer. How about that? The king was intrigued, but he didn't know that such powerful magic existed. So he had to sleep on this and decided not to kill Jason and Medea just yet. But the king's daughters, meanwhile, were more than intrigued and wanted to see their father regain his youth. So Medea gave them a demonstration of those powers. Medea chopped up an old sheep and cooked it in a cauldron along with magical herbs. And then out of the cauldron, a young, powerful sheep emerged. The king's daughters were amazed. And so in the night, they chopped up their father in his sleep and brought his pieces to Medea for her to give him eternal youth. And Medea cooked the king in a stew, but didn't add the magical herbs. So the king stayed dead. Again, Medea, no chill. Also, let's take a moment that without Heracles and Medea, this entire epic would have just been an epic failure. Of course, you can't exactly kill a king without consequences. The king still had many supporters in the city, so they took up arms against Jason and his witch wife and chased him and Medea out of the city and they had to flee to Corinth, where they found exile. But in Corinth, Jason also found a beautiful young princess, more beautiful and younger than Medea, and on top of that, a princess with connections, a princess that can give him an army to regain his kingdom. So Jason decided to dump Medea and marry the princess. And he straight up told Medea, you never really did anything for me. Aphrodite made you love me in the first place. So if I were to thank anyone, it wouldn't be you, it would be Aphrodite. Oh. oh boy, Jason must not have been paying attention about Medea having absolutely no chill. Man, this woman was like, okay, 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 you go, you go, you go marry a little princess. Yeah, you do that. See what happens. So on the wedding day of Jason and his princess wife, Medea cursed the bride's dress to be irremovable and catch on fire. And so the princess burned to death and her father, the king, also burned to a crisp trying to save his daughter. Then, to further prove that she has absolutely no chill, Medea killed the two children she had with Jason. Because when she scorches earth, she scorches earth. But after all that was done, and all this blood was spilled, Medea took a moment to reflect and said, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I'd like to take this chance to apologize to absolutely nobody. Medea then fled the city before anybody could catch her, and her story 
continues elsewhere. As for Jason, he eventually did reclaim the throne by getting help from one of his former Argonaut crew members, Achilles' father, Peleus. But in breaking his vows to Medea, Jason also had broken his vow to Hera, whose name he had sworn on to forever love Medea. And so the goddess no longer favored Jason. And remember how I told you early on that Hera is the queen of holding grudges? Yeah, being on Hera's bad side, Jason's luck ran out entirely. Even though he now had the throne, Jason was miserable and alone. The only joy he had left was the memory of his adventures with the Argonauts and their ship, the Argo. But even the mighty Argo was no longer blessed by Hera, so now its wood started to rot and the great ship was slowly falling apart over the years. And one day, when a depressed Jason slept under the Argo to dream the memories of his glory days, the Argo collapsed under the weight of its age, collapsed on top of Jason, killing the former captain of the Argonauts in his sleep. And that was the tale of Jason and the Argonauts.